current flowing into the armature of a DC machine produces its own flux which creates a residual flux density at the interpolar location. So, that the coils undergoing commutation the voltage induced in the coils undergoing commutation is not exactly 0. This creates some problem for commutation which we will discuss in detail today. The flux density in other places except for the interpolar region can be compensated using compensating winding, but since the compensating winding is a pole facing winding and the pole arcs do not extend really up to the interpolar region, a compensating winding cannot compensate for the armature reaction flux at the interpolar location. For that we need some other arrangements, but first we will find out what are the effects of the armature reaction flux at the interpolar location and what is its effect on the commutation of a DC machine. So, in a DC machine let us say DC generator this is the field poles north pole and south pole this is the brush position nominal brush position the interpolar region and let us say the machine is rotating in this direction as a generator these are the armature conductors the polarity of the currents will be in such a direction which will oppose the rotation. If we take a developed diagram of this, that is cut it open, look somewhat like this. For simplicity we have assumed a two pole machine, this is the north pole, this is the south pole. So, these are the armature one brush is here, the other brush is here.
the flux density waveform due to the armature due to the field the strapezoidal while the armature reaction flux is such that <coughs> it produces a flux density of the pole left behind, machine is moving in this direction. So, produces a residual flux density at the brush position which induces a voltage in the coil undergoing commutation and creates problem with commutation. We will see what kind of problem may arise. For that, let us look at the developed diagram of a armature and the commutator segments. So, this is these are the commutators each commutator connects to two windings two coils. So, let us say at any time a brush is in contact with commutator number 1. Carrying a current into it and the other brush let us say is here one pole pitch apart. carrying out the same current. So, the brush current enters into the coil, divides into two parts and flows in this manner. Let us say this individual coil currents are I C, this is I C, this is also I C. Therefore, the total brush current entering is 2 I C. Similarly, 2 I C will be flowing out here
it is to be seen that at the position of the brush the direction of circulation of the current in the coils reverses and between two brush the coils are the current circulate in the same direction. Now, let us say this commutator segment is moving with a velocity of V c in this direction. So, let us look at what happens when the commutation takes place from commutator number 1 to commutator number 2. So, let us magnify this position, this is commutator number 1 and 2. These are separated by an insulation. Current is entering. to the commutator through the brush. Just say this was coil number 1, this is coil number 2. So, at the beginning of com the commutation process begins when the leading edge of this brush coincides with the end of the insulation between the two successive commutators. Let us also define a few other quantities. For example, let us say the width of one commutator segment is W c, this is W c. width of commutator segment is W c, width of the mica insulation here is W m and width of the brush is W b. In this particular case, we will assume W b equal to W c plus W m, although it is not necessary. In many cases, brass widths are more. After some time, the position of the commutator of the brushes will be as follows. This is the mica insulation, the brush would have moved connecting both the commutators.
this current is still I C. We see that this current is still 2 I C. We see that during this position, these two commutator segments are shorted by the brush. This coil, coil 1 is now shorted by the brush. In the beginning, the coil current 1 was I C in this direction. <coughs> this 2 I C divides into this 2 by let us say I y and I x. So, we have I x plus I y equal to 2 I c. In the process of commutation, this current will change. The current through this coil which was I C previously, it will change to minus I C. Let us see how. And at the end of commutation, The commutation process will end when the brush has completely left commutator segment 1, the current flowing still in this direction. this was coil 1, this is coil 2. So, once it has left, this current will now be 2 I C, this current will be I C and this current will be I C. So, we see if we look at coil current 1, coil 1 current, see in the beginning of the commutation, it was I C flowing from left to right at the end of commutation it still becomes I C, but from right to left. So, in the meantime during the shorting period the current in coil 1 changes from plus I C to minus I C and the time taken can be easily calculated by the commutation time T C equal to during commutation the brush has moved moved by an amount W B minus W M 
by V C. During this period, the current in coil 1 must change from if we assume this direction to be positive from plus I C to minus I C. Graphically, we can show it in this manner. Interesting, this is the instant at which commutation began. At this time, current in coil 1 was plus I C and let us say this is the time when commutation ends. this time being T c commutation time during this period the current changes to at this instant current changes to minus I c. The question remains how the current change here ideally we would like the current to change linearly at a constant rate from plus I C to minus I C. This is called the ideal commutation characteristics, but in practice it is never so. There are several reasons for this. In some cases, even when commutator segment 1, commutator segment, the brush segment has left commutator segment 1 has moved to commutator segment 2, the current has not fully reversed, but it has reversed only partially. So, maybe it has reached a value of minus I C dash. If that is the case, then when the contact with commutator segment 1 breaks at the end of commutation, then there will be a sparking the amount of sparking current will be this. This is called under commutation that is the commutation has not completed before the brush has moved from one commutator segment to the next commutator segment. Now, this is not desirable since the sparking destroys the commutator surface may also lead to fire hazard. So, this has to be minimized, but let us first find out what are the reasons for under commutation. First is the self inductance of the coil. We see that the current changes from in time T c the current changes from plus I C to minus I C. So, the net change in current is 2 I C. Now, the coil undergoing commutation has some leakage inductance. This is mostly due to the overhang part of each coil. So, a coil will have a leakage inductance of L C. So, this leakage inductance will delay the change in current in the coil undergoing commutation. Not only the leakage inductance of the coil due to armature reaction we have seen that the armature reaction flux, armature reaction flux leaves a residual flux at the interpolar axis which is of the same polarity as the pole left behind in the generating mode. So, there will be a voltage induced in the coil undergoing commutation which will prevent or delay the change in the current in the coil undergoing commutation leading to under commutation. 
as we have said that the effect of under commutation is to produce spark this is to be avoided. There are several ways of mitigating the effect of under commutation. One is to use additional resistance in the form of brush contact resistance in the coil undergoing commutation. Let us see if the brush resistance or as along with the contact resistance is large enough then the time constant formed by the leakage inductance of the coil and the brush contact resistance may be small which will hasten the change in coil undergoing commutation and will reduce spark. This is with brush with brush resistance. This is called resistance commutation, but this cannot completely eliminate the sparking. For that, it is necessary that we neutralize the residual flux at the this is necessary to neutralize the residual flux at the interpolar region. There are different ways of doing it. One is the so called giving a brush lead. If instead of putting the brush actually at the interpolar region, if we shift it or lead it that is move it in the direction of rotation in the generating mode, what will happen is that in the process of rotation the induced voltage in the coils will change to the polarity of the pole ahead before it reaches the brush. So, there will be a voltage induced in the coil undergoing commutation which will assist or hasten the change in current in the coil undergoing commutation. So, this can mitigate to some extent the problem of under commutation. However, as we have seen earlier that giving a brush lead creates a demagnetizing MMF along the direct axis that is the pole axis. Because once you have shift the brushes, the polarity of the currents will there will change and the if you have given a brush lead of beta, then the conductors between the angle 2 beta will produce a demagnetizing flux which will tend to reduce the main flux. This is called the demagnetizing ampere turns. and it is directly proportional to the brush shift given. So, although giving a shift to the brush lead to the brush may help commutation it will have a demagnetizing effect on the main flux which can be of course, compensated by increasing the ampere turns on the main flux. Another approach of providing additional ampere turns is by providing what we call the interpoles. The interpoles are short poles provided between two main poles.
So, these are the main poles let us say. This is the armature, these are the brushes. The main flux. out of this flows in this direction. This is the main flux. Let us say in the generating mode the direction of rotation is this. In which case if we take two armature conductors, the polarity of the currents will be this dot, this cross, In which case, in the generating mode, the MMF produced by the armature coils, because these are all cross here, and all dots here.
so the armature mmf produced the armature flux armature mmf armature reaction flux will tend to flow in this direction In other words, the armature MMF will produce a virtual north pole at the interpolar region, a flux that is equivalent to a north pole that is the pole left behind in the generating mode. So, if we want to cancel this flux then in the interpolar region we can put an actual south pole that is this south pole and a north pole here so that the flux produced by this north pole will cancel the armature reaction not only it will cancel the armature reaction flux, but it will also produce a flux which will generate a voltage in the coil undergoing commutation of the polarity in the that it will have under the pole ahead in the generating mode which will assist commutation. So, these are called interpoles, interpoles are short and narrow pole structures placed at the interpolar location in order to compensate the interpolar armature reaction flux. And since the interpol is supposed to compensate the armature reaction flux, these are excited by the armature current that is it should the interpolar interpoles are excited by the armature current that is the coil on the interpole is connected in series with the armature winding. So, that at all load conditions it can cancel the armature reaction flux. Now, let us see how much this flux density at the interpolar region is required. The voltage induced in the coil at the interpolar location will be 2 times the interpolar flux density desired interpolar flux density B i into length of the conductor into velocity of the armature 
into number of turns this should cancel the voltage due to the self inductance of the coil undergoing commutation so ideally what we should have is that with the interpoles will not only compensate the armature reaction ampere turns but in addition it should also generate a flux density at the interpolar location such that the voltage induced due to the in the coil undergoing commutation due to that flux density cancels the voltage induced by the leakage inductance of the coil undergoing commutation. However, there is a practical difficulty because finding out the value of the leakage inductance is not easy and this flux density has to be set by somewhat a trial or error method. Once we have find out the required flux density V i, then the required ampere turns for the interpol can be calculated as follows. Ampere turns the interpol should be equal to peak armature reaction ampere turns plus the ampere turns required to generate a flux density of B i at the interpol. Since if we neglect the ampere turns required to circulate flux in the core, this is given by where B i is the flux density required flux density at the interpol of the desired polarity mu 0 is the permeability L g is the length of air gap at the interpol total length of air gap at the interpol and of course, mu naught is the permeability of the free space. Now, peak ampere turn we know per pole is given by equal to if the armature current is I A, then the current in each parallel path is I A by A. If there are z number of conductors, then turns per pole is z by 2 p. So, the peak ampere turns is given by I A Z by 2 A P. So, from which we will be able to calculate the required ampere turns of the interpoles and the corresponding number of turns in the interpoles. So, let us try to solve some problems involving the commutation and induced voltage interpoles etcetera of a DC machine. Let us say that we have a DC machine with 8 poles there are 960 that is p equal to 8 there are 960 conductors that is z equal to 960 which are lap connected the 
the flux purple of the machine is 40 milliweber. If we want a no load induced voltage E of 256 volts, what should be the speed of rotation? This is a straightforward application of the formula of induced voltage which is given by E equal to phi p into z n p by 60 a, where phi p is the flux purple, z is the total number of conductor, n is the speed of rotation in rpm, p is the number of poles and a is the number of parallel paths. In other words, n can be written as 60 e a divided by phi p z p. In the given problem, p equal to 8, z equal to 960, phi p equal to 40 into 10 to the power minus 3 and since the machine is armature is lap connected a is equal to p equal to 8. Therefore, the answer will be n equal to substituting all these values we get n equal to 400 rpm. It will be interesting to find out if I run the machine at same 400 rpm, but change the armature conductor connection to wave, what will be the induced voltage? We know for wave connection, A equal to always 2. So, for wave E wave, will be equal to phi p z n p by 60 a substituting the values phi p equal to 40 into 10 to the power minus 3 z equal to 960 a equal to 2 p equal to 8 we get E wave equal to 1024 volts. So, the induced voltage in a wave connected machine at the same speed will be much higher. Now, let us look at the problem of commutation. Let us say that we have a machine with four pole which carries a full load armature current I A of 143 amperes. There are total 492 wave connected conductors. In order to mitigate the commutation problem, a phase lead beta of 10 degrees is applied to the brushes. What will be the demagnetizing ampere terms? 
we have seen in our previous class that armature reaction flux A T peak is given by I A by A which is the coil current into Z by 2 P. <coughs> if we look at the picture, let us say this is the nominal magnetic neutral axis. If I give a phase lead the brushes of beta, we have seen earlier that all the conductors inside the angle 2 beta produces inside the angle 2 beta produces demagnetizing ampere turns. So, the demagnetizing ampere turns D mag A T will be equal to A T peak beta and is the 2 beta is the angle over which the conductors will demagnetize and between two poles the separation is 2 pi by p So, demagnetizing A T will be Z I A by A into 2 P into beta P by pi or this will be equal to Z I A beta by 2 pi A. Substituting the given values, A is the number of parallel paths and in this case A equal to 2. Substituting the values, we get demagnetizing A T demagnetizing equal to 1011. If the field current is known, then we can find out the number of extra turns that will be required on the field winding in order to cancel this demagnetizing A T. So, this divided by field current will give you the number of extra field turns required for this machine.